Hey guys, this problem is going to test your ability to use energy methods. Alright, so this is the problem. Basically, we've got this block traveling at a constant velocity, and it hits an initially unstretched spring, and then the spring starts being compressed until it reaches a maximum compression of 10 centimeters. What that means is, is that this distance here is 10 centimeters from here to here. Okay, and my question to you is what is the initial velocity of the spring required such that this compression happens given that the spring stiffness is 10 newtons per meter and given that the mass of the block is 4 kilograms. Have a shot at this yourself first and then come back when you're done. Now previously I've done this problem using Newton's laws and you can totally do that if you want to. However, I think the easiest way to do this is the way I'm about to do it right now which is using energy methods. And the way you're going to solve this problem using energy methods is using the formula the change in mechanical energy is equal to the work done by non-conservative forces. That is the fundamental formula we use. right? Now in order to know what non-conservative forces are, in order to know what the uh, change in uh, mechanical energy is, let's actually draw a free body diagram first. Okay, well I am going to create an axis just here. I'm going to create an axis just here, just for fun, right there, x, y. Okay, now not only that, but we know that if we consider what happens when the block meets the spring, actually let me draw it below, let's redraw our scenario here, let's consider the forces acting on our block when the block is at least partially compressed, at le when the spring is at least partially compressed by the block. So let's say the block is say over here, right, and the spring's being compressed by some distance, let's say that, let's say it's been compressed by some distance, say x, right here, so that means this was where our spring was, and this is where our spring is now, and it's been compressed a distance x, okay, right, so let's consider the forces acting on this block sometime during compression, we're going to have a whole bunch of forces, we're going to have kx here to the left, we're going to have our force due to gravity downwards, mg, and we're also going to have our um, normal force, n, just here, right? Out of all of these forces, um, the only non-conservative force is our normal force. But notice that it does no work because the normal force doesn't actually move the block in any direction. The block is stuck in the horizontal plane, and so the normal force does no work. Remember, for work you need a force times a corresponding distance. Okay, so basically, the work done by non-conservative forces is zero because the normal force does no work. Now let's expand out the left-hand side of this equation. It's going to be the change in kinetic energy plus the change in gravitational potential energy plus the change in elastic energy is going to be equal to zero, your right-hand side of your equation. Okay, well, kinetic energy is fairly similar. We're only dealing with rectilinear motion, so that's going to be a half m v2 squared minus v1 squared plus, in fact let me write it down, I feel like I'll need some space. Change in kinetic energy turns into a half m v2 squared minus v1 squared. Change in gravitational potential energy turns into m g h2 minus h1. And change in elastic energy, <coughs> sorry, change in elastic energy is going to be a half uh, k x2 squared minus x1 squared. Right, and that's going to be equal to zero. Notice that um, this is kinetic energy just here, just the linear component of it because nothing's rotating. This is the gravitational potential energy component just here, and this is your elastic energy component just here. Now, before we progress with this problem, let me just quickly talk about some terms. V refers to your speed. It's, it's, it's not a vector, it's a scalar. It just refers to the speed of your block at, at your second state right, v2 anyway. h2 will refer to your height of your block at your second state, from some reference point, from some axis, say. And x2 will refer to how, how much the spring is stretched at your second state. Okay, so now that we've talked about that a little bit, let's actually find out what these states are to practice our skills a little bit. Well, let's consider this state 1, when the block actually just starts meeting the spring. Let's consider this state 1 just here. Right? What's going to be the velocity of our block? Well, it's traveling at a constant velocity, so that means v1 is going to be equal to v. Remember, v right here is our initial velocity just here. Not only that, but we know that h, h1 is actually going to be equal to 0 as well. Notice that our axis, I've placed my axis such that h2, h1 will be very easy to analyze. It's just it's 0 because um, it hasn't moved from our axis just here. Um, and x1 
is going to be equal to zero as well. The spring is unstretched when the block just meets it. Okay, so that, that's our state one. What about state two? What about state two? What is V2? Well, using our intuition, we should be able to tell that V2 will actually be equal to zero. Think about it. If a spring is just being compressed by a block and then it reaches its maximum compression, that means at that instant, the block has no velocity. Right, it's being it's 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 stopped for an instant, and then it's going to start moving towards the left. So v2 is actually zero at this instant of maximum compression. H2, for the same reasons, is actually going to be is actually going to be equal to zero. That's because in our second, um, in our second case, our axis is just here as well. Right, so the distance you need to get from your axis towards the center of mass of your block is still zero. Okay, and what about x2? What about x2? Well, this is the tricky bit. What is the compression of our spring at our second state? Well, we're given it. It's 10 centimeters, which is 0 0.1 meters. Fantastic. So let's plug in all these values right here and solve the problem using algebra. Well, we know this is going to be a half m, which is a half times 4, times v2 squared, which was 0, minus v1 squared, which was v, plus m, I should say, 4, 4, times 9.81, that's gravity, times h2 minus h1. Notice that's just 0 minus 0. And as a brief aside, it really didn't matter where we placed our axis, right? I mean, we could have placed our axis up here if we wanted to. Either way, the change in height is going to be equal to 0. So this term will always be eliminated, our gravitational potential energy, which makes sense, right? The block isn't elevating or lowering. It's staying in the same horizontal plane. All right, so that's that sorted. Now let's do the um, elastic energy component. This is a half times k, which is 10, times by x2 squared. What's x2? That's 0 0.1 squared minus x1, which is 0, and that's going to be equal to 0, your right-hand side. Cool. This becomes just algebra now. So that'll become minus 2v. This becomes all eliminated to 0, so that's plus 0, plus a half times 10, which is 5, times 0 0.1 squared is going to be equal to 0. Solving for v now, we can say 2v is going to be equal to 5 times 0 0.1 squared, meaning v must be equal to, plugging into my calculator, uh, my apologies, this should be v squared. This should be v squared just here. That should be v squared, that should be v squared, that should be v squared. I apologize if um, that confused any of you. Um, and once you plug that into your calculator, you're left with v squared is going to be equal to 5 times 0 0.1 squared over 2, meaning v is in fact going to be equal to the square root of that, which is the square root of 5 times 0.1 squared over 2. So v is going to be equal to 0 0.158 meters per second. That is the speed of your block at its initial condition. That is this speed right here. Let me write that down for you. That is this speed. V is 0 0.158 meters per second. Notice the consistency. This is the second time I've done this problem, but this problem I did it using energy methods. We get the same answer. So this really goes to show it doesn't matter how you approach a problem, as long as you approach it using the, you, it doesn't matter how you use um, the formulas, as long as you actually apply the formulas correctly. I hope that made sense.